film is a pretty open-ended art form of storytelling. There are so many movies with characters of varying degrees of personality. The perfect hero, the villain, the comedic sidekicks, the damsel in distress, the powerful female lead, the anti-hero. These characters can be used to promote an ideal that the film is trying to put forward or as a critique of society that the filmmaker wants to create. But on some occasions, this moral line can be blurred and it becomes increasingly important to decipher where this line is when historical subject matters are at stake. I believe that although the filmmaker is still at artistic liberty to tweak with these historical events, they come with more responsibility than that of the average film. Terrence Malick's 2005 epic historical drama, The New World, has stunningly beautiful visuals. I mean, from the cinematography and the landscapes to the costume design and set design, but it also unfortunately has a rather shallow and tried look into the story of Pocahontas. The true story of Pocahontas is extremely dark. The story of a girl who was just 12 or 13 when the Jamestown colony first arrived. Her first husband was murdered by colonizers and she was remarried to a white man. She was brought to England manned by the same boats that enslaved her people, but she suffered a very different type of slavery herself. She was paraded around in royal clothes as evidence of the taming of the indigenous savage. She was completely stripped of her own culture until she died of disease at the age of 21. It's dark stuff, but it could potentially make for great cinema, especially as it is a reflection to our world today with the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic. Native women are murdered and sexually assaulted at rates as high as 10 times the average in certain counties in the U.S. On some reservations, 96% of sexual violence committed against women were done so by non-natives. Of the 5,712 known missing and murdered Native women in 2016, only 116 were logged into the Department of Justice database. So a great Pocahontas movie would represent a very real problem, not just back in the 1600s, but one that continues to this very day. The New World is not the first film to bring Pocahontas to the silver screen, most notably the Disney 1995 classic animated film named after her. This version of her, an adult at the time of the English arrival, falls in love with a man she never had a relationship with, and it's how most people see her. It's a complete insult and bastardized version of her tragic life. Disney would never make a princess movie about Anne Frank. Just the thought of it should make you sick. But Disney's Pocahontas was received a high acclaim, proving this story is something many people misunderstand, partially because of the lies we are told about history. But back to the new world. Terrence Malick is a director I admire very much. He attempts to make an artful and poetic look into Pocahontas' life, how destructive imperialism is, and strips away innocence. He completely fails. Instead of turning this false Disney narrative of Pocahontas and her white colonizer lover, John Smith, into something more creative, he just decides to mimic it. Pocahontas is not 12 years old in this movie although the actress that plays her is just 14, which makes the intimate scenes between her and Colin Farrell incredibly uncomfortable, even if they do nothing illegal. But does the new world use this disgusting fake age gap to commentate on the rape of indigenous people that happens to this very day? No, of course it doesn't. Their love is portrayed as innocent and beautiful, She's brought to England, but she's brought there with her people to be celebrated and treated as royalty. And that's a pretty common problem with the New World, actually. Malik's film changes so much, but none of the changes ever question anything about the story that is falsified over and over again. Not Pocahontas' life, or her freedom, or the land of her people, but, but the fake love between her and John Smith which is ironically the most imperialistic thing a movie could ever do. 
It's just a complete gentrification of her story. Andrew Dominic's 2007 masterpiece, The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, is a great feat in filmmaking, acting, and storytelling. It takes a similar approach to the New World as it is a poetic retelling of historical events that is trying to say something beyond just the events that occur. However, The Assassination of Jesse James actually succeeds in this retelling as its historical changes strengthen the themes of the mythos of the celebrity that appear in both the film and in real life. Robert Ford grows up to idolize the great stories of Jesse James. He's nervous as he meets the man and forms a relationship with him. As Jesse James isn't merely a man to him, he's a legend, he's his childhood hero. But Jesse James isn't like this at all. He's not the legend Robert Ford thought he knew so well. He's rather reckless. He lacks an ideology. He's not selfless, he's prideful. And beyond his charisma, he's not too exceptional from any of the other characters in the film. James doesn't even try to play up his legend. He actually confirms their falsehoods to Ford's face, yet Ford chooses to continue in believing them. A series of events occur that lead Robert Ford responsible for the killing of Jesse James who is increasingly getting sick both physically and mentally, as well as increasingly aware that his murder is coming. He almost welcomes it. Ford receives similar notoriety as the man he killed for his actions, which leads to his own eventual downfall. The assassination of Jesse James is a deconstruction of the romanticized West that we are used to seeing on screen. The story is not of epic scale, there are no heroes or villains. The characters don't explore the typical landscapes or even dress how one might in the typical western. But most importantly, there is no justification of the actions made by any of the characters. Just like when Robert Ford discovers Jesse James is not the man he's been told about, and the fame he achieves is not as beautiful or as lavish as he imagined. Many components of the assassination of Jesse James were true. Where it departs from reality is this idea of Jesse James' suicidal welcome to his own demise. It isn't just a spur of the moment twist at the end. We see his character slowly deteriorate. We are reminded over and over again that Jesse James is never without his guns, even in his sleep. And yet, when he should be most suspicious of his life coming to an end, he purposely makes himself vulnerable by removing them. He even discusses the concept of death with another character as he shoots his gun beneath his feet at the hole of a frozen lake. But really, it doesn't matter that this was made up. It works so perfectly with the theme of the film and its critique of how we perceive the past. He doesn't welcome his death heroically, he does it because he's flawed. And it's a far more complex and interesting portrayal of the flawed western man than that of a John Wayne or Clint Eastwood character. His flaws aren't romanticized like what we see in classic westerns or what Robert Ford saw in him growing up. He is but just a man. As I said at the beginning, film is an open-ended art form of storytelling. Many of the ideas we have about society come from the ideas that film feeds to us at a young age. Yes, art is subjective, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a right or wrong way of telling a story. The new world might be visually stunning, but its historical inaccuracies do nothing but promote lies and tropes that we've been told to believe. Both in the downplay of the atrocities in our history books and our purposeful ignorance of problems today, but also in our media like the Disney film of the same story. The assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford is like the antidote to the new world. It takes these ideas that we have been told about the past and these concepts we learn through film and slaps them in the face 
both have the dismay of Robert Ford the character and the man, but also in the face of the audience. It may embellish at points and not be 100% accurate, but these inaccuracies just strengthen the narrative. History has a lot of history behind it, so an adaption of a real event should be taken seriously. That doesn't mean you can't change anything, it's difficult to condense something into two hours, but you should be asking yourself why are you making these changes and what do they imply?